stocky, broad of body, and extremely muscular. The short figure before you may lack in height, but not in physical strength or presence. Wrapped in metal armor and armed with a war axe, the humanoid has light brown skin, ruddy cheeks, and bright eyes, with black hair and a long, carefully groomed beard and mustache. This, of course, is a dwarf, one of the primary species of Dungeons and Dragons. This is going to start a fairly long series of videos where we're gonna try and break down everything that you should know about these guys, and more importantly, the sort of stuff that 5th edition just will not tell you. We will answer age-long questions like, do dwarf females have beards? Is it like Lord of the Rings where you cannot tell apart a female from a male? What happens if you mix a dwarf and a human, or a dwarf and an elf? We of course know that there are half-elves, but are there half-dwarves? We will talk about this and more, including their psychology, their physiology, we will talk about what they like to wear, their crafts and arts, dwarf marriage, dwarvish funerals, we will cover everything from their society to even their culture. We will do it all, including the greatest secret of the dwarvish species, which might change the way you see dwarves for the rest of your life. But, before we do that, I have an announcement that I am very excited to make. I just finished up my second PDF. This one is called Mr. Rex's Monster Classes, and as the number there implies, it is the first of many that I'll be making because, man, did I enjoy building this. And I do think that it is sorely needed. So what I have created here is the ability to play as monsters. I have designed not just racial features, but full class features so that you can go from level 1 to level 20 as a diva, as a succubus, and as a ghost. And this includes tables that you can use to better prepare the backstory for your character. As a succubus, you can control enemies with your charm abilities, you get powerful spellcasting features, and you have four different subclass options. Check this out. Immortal acts define your kind and shackle you to your fiendish form. Choose the nature of the sin which has swayed your wicked soul. Pride, lust, vanity, or wrath. Each deadly sin is a different subclass, and it encompasses many different styles with which you can play your succubus. Pride is my favorite, it's meant to be a very powerful spellcaster. Lust is a disruptive spellcaster, on the other hand, great for throwing off your enemies. Vanity is a martial class that focuses on long whips and beautiful acrobatic maneuvers. And then, wrath is, of course, the femme fatale, the martial assassin who uses her looks to achieve her objectives. The ghost is probably one of my proudest creations so far. When you build a ghost, you get to decide what is exactly it that you're hunting. Whether you're hunting, you know, like a creepy house or a graveyard or maybe even just like an object, like a mirror. When you level up as a ghost, you get these supernatural manifestations which change the way that your ghost presents itself and also changes the way your hunt operates. For example, the touch of the grave supernatural manifestation, it makes you look like a skeletal being rather than a full-blown ghost. It then gives you the ability to prevent enemies from healing when you touch them. And then lastly, it makes the area around the place that you hunt prevent magical or supernatural healing. We have over 20 of these different manifestations that can make your ghost very unique and very special. Because every ghost is different. You can have a ghost that looks like Casper, or a ghost that looks like the Headless Horseman, or a ghost that looks like the creepy girl from The Ring. There are so many different variations and I have added tons of different supernatural manifestations to represent that. The class is super fun, using fear mechanics and curses to weaken and overwhelm the enemies. Lastly, there is the Deva, which of course are angels that descend from the heavens into the material plane. The Deva uses holy energy which functions like mana instead of spell slots, and you use that energy to fuel your divine abilities which are considerable. What's cool about the Deva is that you don't regain your holy energy through rest, since Devas are of course immune to exhaustion. They don't need to rest, instead you regain your energy by doing good deeds or following the tenets of the gods that you serve. I wanted to to bring back fan favorite abilities from previous editions like Channel Energy or Touch of Law. Check this. As an action, you can touch a willing creature, infusing it with the power of divine order and allowing it to treat all attack rolls, ability checks, and saving throws until the end of your next turn as if the d20 roll resulted in an 11. See, I want these are like very famous old school abilities that I wanted to bring back. Really cool features that we used to have for clerics in the past, but we never got in 5th edition, so this was a great opportunity for me to add this. So yeah, guys, I have personally written every single word from this PDF. I have spent so much time building these classes so that you guys could enjoy playing the monsters that you see all the time in your games. And I have spent countless hours making sure that it is all balanced so that your DM doesn't get upset with you. <laughs> if you wanted to check it out, you can either click the link in the description below or you can click this picture right here under the video. Either will take you to the store where you can see it. I really appreciate you guys for supporting me all this time and I, and I cannot wait to bring you more stuff like this. But now, back to the video. Okay. There is so much content. Where do I even begin? Uh, let's see. Let, let's do this. So what even is a dwarf? 
The dwarves are humanoids, about four to four and a half feet in height, so fairly small. However, they are incredibly dense. They are described as having the breadth and depth of creatures nearly twice their height, but what does that even mean? Uh, basically, they are incredibly muscular, to the point where their size doesn't really prevent them from competing or doing anything strength-related that a human would otherwise be able to do. In fact, in many ways, they are often even stronger on average. Their arms are very long for their size, reaching all the way down to their shins. But the rest of their body, like their torsos and their legs, are in proportion to their size. Their bodies have thick, well-rounded limbs and broad and powerful shoulders and hips. And this, by the way, applies to both sexes. Now, female dwarves are built muscularly thick. Both sexes are also extremely hairy, producing copious amounts of hair everywhere on their body. So, so uh, yeah, this is gonna be a band-aid that I'm gonna just go ahead and rip from the beginning. Uh, D&D generic female dwarves do not have beards. But the female dwarves from the Forgotten Realms do have beards. I do want to stress this out because uh, sometimes there is a fair amount of difference between the creatures from the Monster Manuals and then creatures from the very specific worlds like the Forgotten Realms. Uh, most things that I will say in this video will apply to both, but the uh, beard situation is certainly one where they are opposite. But that's about it as far as physical description. Uh, we could talk about skin color, eye color, hair colors, but that is dependent on where the dwarf is from. Specifically, if we're talking about mountain dwarves or hill dwarves, and that that's gonna be a whole different video, uh, since in here we're gonna talk about all dwarves. Now before we go in deep, there is one last clarification that you guys need to understand. Uh, not everything that we will talk about on this video from now on will apply to dwarves that live outside of dwarvish communities. This would include dwarves that live in human settlements, or dwarves that are adventurers, or dwarves that were born outside of dwarvish societies. See, we will touch on a lot of cultural stuff, which obviously becomes less relevant when you have a dwarf that wasn't born in a dwarvish city. However, a lot of the psychological makeshift of the species, which we will also touch on, will probably apply to all dwarves. But yeah, generally keep in mind that the, the focus here is a dwarf that lives in underground ground communities with other dwarves. And you can apply this to your own dwarvish character if you wish, but just keep that in mind. But all right, let's uh, begin. Many people associate the dwarf character as an eccentric, maybe even boisterous Scottish-speaking person. Uh, sometimes as a comedic character, perchance. And many people take that inspiration, of course, from Gimli from Lord of the Rings, but according to Ed Greenwood, who created the dwarves from the Forgotten Realms, of them he would say, quote, grim mystery laced with sadness and pride. These are the images that come to mind when one think of dwarves. They are the images that should come to players' minds when dwarves come on stage during play in the realms." End quote. Grim mystery laced with sadness and pride. See, the thing about dwarves is that they are a people in decay, a species that has fallen from their heyday, who are grasping at a world that is slowly inking away from them. They are a race in decline that have chosen to look towards their gods in steadfast fashion. This combined with the fact that dwarves are inherently pessimist. They have these popular sayings that go, Every fair sky hides a lurking cloud. Or, The gold you have yet to win gleams the brightest. Dwarves find themselves constantly preparing for the worst. You combine these facts with their psychological tendency to be inflexible and stubborn, and that leads to a species that will slowly move towards oblivion, unable to change or adapt. A dour, proud, taciturn, and inflexible race that holds grudges and never forgets them. A race that has a morbid dislike and mistrust of all strangers, in particular to non-dwarves. Now, why are they in decay, though? Well, I mean, the real answer is because of Durogar and Drow, who basically hunted them all down underground. But the reason they can't quite ever get back their lost glory, and why, in spite of the fact that those days of legendary warfare are nearly over, they're still bound to be in decay, is because of an interesting secret that really just defines their entire race. This we call the Doom of the Dwarves. A tragic secret that these species have dealt with for eons, thinking that it was normal, but in fact, it wasn't. Dwarves have a very, very low birth rate. The number is stipulated to be that around 45% of all dwarves are actually infertile. And that applies to both sexes. And to compound to this tragedy, 70% of all babies born are male, with only 30% being female. This means that the chances of having fertile female dwarves are fairly uncommon. Now, culturally to dwarves, this is normal. 
This is something that they have lived with since forever. Like, they wouldn't see this as weird. In fact, the lore actually states that a, a normal dwarf that lives deep within its isolated dwarvish community would believe that the reason that humans, for example, are so numerous versus dwarves is literally just because humans mate constantly. Like, it, it's funny, but, but it is in the lore that dwarves actually believe that humans just fuck everyone they see. And because they fuck so much, they are very numerous. They think the same about orcs, in fact. See, dwarves are an extremely monogamous species because a dwarf's mind tends to focus hard on a single thing for its whole life. This is why you see a dwarf, say, just train and focus on blacksmithing blades for his entire life, or it might just focus on crafting rings for his entire life. And their mind is such that they are very centered and stubborn to change, and this applies to relationships as well. See, when they see humans changing relationships all the time, doing, you know, one-night stands and etc., uh, to them that is just, like, wild. Many of them just see that as the reason why they're not numerous when compared to humans or other races. Other dwarves, the ones that do get to adventure outside of their otherwise you know, lonely and isolated underground communities uh, do get to see the real truth. Something is very wrong with the Dwarven Seed. As some sages speculate that the low fertility is due to exposure to heat, bizarre alloys and metal toxins, of which dwarves are of course in constant contact all the time. But the good news is that there is a solution. The dwarves that are in the know of this, they call it the secret salvation of the rays. That is, that dwarves can actually procreate with humans, gnomes, and halflings. The uh, verdict is still out there for what exactly happens when a dwarf mates with an elf. We know that they're called a dwarf, funnily enough, but we don't know much about them. Now, what, what happens when a dwarf procreates with a human, a gnome, or a halfling is very, very interesting. See, the dwarvish blood is very strong, and it overpowers the rest. There's a reason why you don't see the player's handbook letting you play a half-dwarf in the same way as you might play a half-elf. And that is because there's virtually no difference between a half-dwarf and a normal dwarf. It just looks like a dwarf. And the only thing that appears to change seems to be the height. So for example, a half-dwarf who had a human and a dwarf parent would be about a foot taller than a pure-blood dwarf, but otherwise the differences are indiscernible. Now, the, the reason that this is called the uh, secret salvation of the dwarves is because if a half-dwarf reproduces with another human, then you still get a half-dwarf that looks identical to a pure dwarf. The, the union of a half-dwarf and a human, no more halfling, will always result in a half-dwarf that looks exactly like a dwarf. But if at any point the half-dwarf reproduces with a full dwarf, then you would get a full dwarf. So in essence, the intermingling of the species, whenever there is a dwarf included, will always result in a dwarf. And this is essentially the future of the dwarf as a species, and the way that it is described in the lore as the only way that the dwarves will stem their slow extinction. This, unironically, also exacerbates the radical demographic monoracial diversity of the species, since any humans that move in to live in dwarvish settlements will inevitably result in just more dwarvish babies and not human babies. Now, of course, humans are very fertile, and reproducing with humans results in dwarvish babies, so many dwarves have come to understand this and, of course, use it to their benefit, or sometimes even as their duty in order to expand their species. Uh, the lore actually even states that evil dwarvish clans have felt forced to raid human settlements whenever they face stagnation and extinction within their kingdoms. They basically enslave humans and use them as cattle for their reproduction, though generally this would be seen more by Duragar than, than actual normal dwarves, since normal dwarves have a very, very strong aversion to slavery. In any case, there are two main factors that influence Dwarvish culture the way they are nowadays, which again, revolves around their decay as a mighty power. One is, of course, their infertility. Because of their low numbers and extremely long life, it further compounds the old ways to stick, which enhances the feeling of their cultural ways being very slow to shift. But the other factor that we haven't talked about has a lot to do with their proclivity for underground dwelling. See, because dwarves prefer to live under stone, there are many societal implications that result from this which have made their culture vastly different from that of many others. Quote, Dwarves come from a very closed environment with very little in the way of personal space or privacy. Expansion of any one settlement is greatly dependent on the location and earth in which it is set. Digging out new living space can be an expensive, time-consuming and possibly dangerous activity. 
For every dwarf city nestled in a roomy expanse of trackless caverns, thousands of smaller settlements exist in which every room has hewn from the surrounding stone by hand. As a result, living quarters are close together and regularly house entire extended families. A society living in close contact with each other day in and day out must, by necessity, place the needs of the group above the needs of the individual. The rule of law becomes paramount in many ways, for only in such a society can disputes be settled fairly and expectations kept reasonable. This cultural trait has become an ingrained habit for nearly all dwarves and is considered a virtue among their people. He who holds to this duty and obeys the law, even at great cost to himself, is held as a hero among his clan and held up as an example to others. Honor, duty, bravery, stoicism, and loyalty are considered the highest virtues in dwarven life. Those who live less responsible existences, as the dwarves might consider it, are subjects of continuing bemusement to the ordered dwarven mind. By the same token, a dwarf who is considered rude or unsociable by other above-ground races is looked at as the soul of manners and tact among his people. For those who live below ground, physical privacy is a thin illusion at best. None but the most wealthy or those of the highest status in dwarf society can claim a space of their very own, to be shared with no one else. This forced physical intimacy has led dwarven culture to prize mental privacy. Thus, emotions are considered highly personal and not readily shared outside the family or clan circles. If a dwarf admits any sort of joy or sorrow, it is an indication of how high the listener has risen in his esteem. The same is true for personal revelations of any kind, including weaknesses or achievements. While this reluctance to show one's emotions is true of most dwarves, however, it is hardly true for every individual. Many dwarves who spend their lives wandering the surface find dwarven attitudes difficult to live with. These individuals are often much more expressive and able to tolerate the seemingly chaotic cultures of humans, elves, and halflings. Still, a dwarf has been caught more than once between the world in which he was raised and the life he has embraced. Such conflicts are often amusing to those who witness them and embarrassing for the dwarf, but bridging two worlds is never easy. Just as some dwarves do not speak unless first spoken to, other, more garrulous dwarves enjoy carousing and boisterous living. Some dwarves happily tell of their own adventures with little prompting and others refuse to let another pay their way, regardless of how little gold might remain to them. A dwarf's actions in the surface world may or may not indicate of his behavior at home. When it comes to other races or cultures, dwarves are surprisingly tolerant, despite their firm belief in the rightness of their own ways. This attitude is due in large part to the reticence bred into the soul of every dwarf. Regardless of his opinion on the peoples he meet, a well-mannered dwarf declines comment, looking on the matter as none of his business. His disapproval might be expressed in other ways. Should someone's behavior violate his own beliefs too violently, but by and large, he leaves well enough alone. An old dwarven platitude states, "Ye cannot spot the weakness in your own work by staring too long at someone else's." End quote. This very interesting dynamic of basically having no space at all underground forces the family unit to be unusually close. For example, a typical dwarven household will have the grandparents, the parents, the uncles, the aunts, and all of your brothers all living together on the same home, sometimes even with children and nephews. So, for example, in your dwarvish room, you might have your wife, your brother, and his wife, and your grandmother all in the same place. And again, that is if you're lucky. See, I say lucky because not everyone even gets a home. The, the expansion of a dwarvish settlement in order to construct new houses happens very slowly. And when it does happen, it is always in order to give newlywed couples a family house for them to live in. If you're not married, which is in fact, you know, the vast majority of male dwarves, since remember, 70% of dwarves are male, so the male to female ratio is kind of bonkers, and then you will most certainly not live in a house. Instead, you will live in common rooms with other single dwarves, like if you were in a hostel. Which again, most dwarves are totally okay with, this is just normal to a dwarf. Uh, traditionally, if the settlement cannot offer new houses to newlyweds, uh, then that would basically signal the time to form an entirely new settlement. Uh, but yeah, in general, in dwarvish culture, the general assumption is that you are never moving out from your family's home, and uh, you're living there for the rest of your life. Now, similar to other cultures that have this very similar style of living, like for example the kobolds, which we talked about before, uh, children are raised communally by the family and clan, and everyone is expected to help with them and their education. 
quote, By the same token, the elderly are considered to be the memory of the clan. Dwarves place a great deal of pride in their ancestry and heritage, and the oldest among them are looked on as living embodiments of the past. To neglect or act disrespectfully to an elder dwarf is one of the greatest offenses anyone can make in dwarf society." End quote. There are two sacrileges that you can make as far as the dwarvish culture is concerned. One is to be disrespectful to an elder, and then the other is to steal, but we will talk about that on a later video. As far as household duties go, uh, and general gender norms are concerned, both male and females tend to be fairly equal, with both being trained in household responsibilities, adult professions, and even warfare. Uh, female dwarves are described as being basically just as muscular as male dwarves are, so even though we are never told explicitly that their strength is the same, it is kind of implied that they both share a similar level of physical power. What is, however, actually described is that because females are much rarer than males, females have managed to obtain a tremendous amount of leverage on dwarvish society, and this, in fact, has allowed them to obtain many rights that were previously out of their reach before. Uh, the lore does state that the only exception to this is for the clergy, which appears to be still a very male-dominated area. But yeah, this is a good topic to go under, actually. Uh, let's talk about relationships between the sexes. Quote, Almost all dwarves are hirsute, covered with at least some hair all over their bodies. Jungle dwarves have the least hair, and shield dwarves the most. Dwarves of both sexes may shave, perfume, trim, and comb all their hair, or tattoo themselves. Hair growth may be inhibited by treating areas of the body with a paste of secret ingredients, then searing the area in open flame. Tattoos also inhibit the growth of hair. Many dwarves, particularly females, oil and shave their bodies regularly. A non-dwarf, seeing a shaggy bearded dwarf in heavy armor and furs that conceals the betraying lines of the female figure, may have trouble determining the dwarf's sex. Most dwarven females dress and walk and fight as males do, and have a similar low-pitched gruff husky voices. Like males, they naturally grow beards, and only some shave. Dwarves of both sexes may trim, perfume, and even hang their beards with gems or gold ornaments." End quote. So as you can see, female dwarves sound like male dwarves, they dress like male dwarves, and they grow beards like male dwarves. So yeah, I guess you could confuse them if you saw them wearing thick clothes, for example. Quote, While many picture dwarves as dusty, dirty smiths and miners, the truth is quite the opposite. The dwarves' familiarity with their underground habitats lets them find and harness underground hot springs, pools, and rivers, providing dwarf settlements of all sizes with fresh water and bathing areas. Dwarven baths are public, though segregated by gender into separate areas and attendance is considered an important social function. As a result, dwarves are typically far cleaner and better groomed than most surface races." End quote. Uh, love in particular is a very strong feeling that dwarves get, even if outsiders might not be able to notice it. Uh, the reason that they might not be able to notice it is because it just takes a while for it to form to a dwarf. See, dwarves are very slow to acclimate, but once they do, they are all about it, so to speak. For example, it takes the average dwarf about 40 years of life before they fall in love for the first time. Then they marry on average when they are in their 60s. For a couple to marry, they need the consent and approval of the chieftain or clan leader which rules the settlement. If for whatever reason the approval is not granted, then the couple will be punished if they continue their romantic relationship. This can range from simply being you know, forcefully separated, to being forced to pay fines, to even being literally exiled from the clan if they continue. In any case, provided that the marriage is accepted, it is common for the parents of both parties to give money to the newlywed couple. Whenever wealthy and powerful dwarves are concerned, in particular with bigger clans, arranged marriages are not uncommon, as many clans perform arranged marriages between each other in order to improve relations. Now, we're gonna go ahead and end it here for this video because we're already at our typical video time limit, but there is an unbelievable amount of lore that I want to cover for the dwarves. There's like four more videos coming. We're gonna touch on clothing, arts and crafts, magic, how they deal with death, religion. I mean, Jesus, there's so much. I'm working on these videos in bulk, so the next video should be out basically real soon in like two days. So don't worry, you won't have to wait too long. And like I said, there's three more videos coming, so stay tuned. I would like to thank my patron supporters, Barry Maskan, 5e Magic Shop, Morgan Johnson, Rusty Rain, Doc Feeder, The Great Codini, Omega Scales, Terry Culp, Benjamin Bosters, Falky951, Ordorix, Abim Kurshab, Thomas Hunt, Stephen, Soulless Rider, Lost Crusaders, Stalia, Treb909, Trevor Hess, George Fotland, 
The Living Guild Pack, D Scribe, Herbert Johnson, The Wizard's Vault, James the Perverted, Shruti Cast, Lucas Cyrek, Nachtor Rashura, Jesse Feliziano, Brian Camp, Chad Aga, John Harley, John the Wicked, Shane and Sam Skinner, Warren Smith, Barak, Alyssa Kestrel, Kristen Coleman, Lactose the Intolerant, Holy Fi, Flame Back 200, and Merton Games for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. If you would like to support me as well, then please head on over to patreon.com slash mrrex to support. Alright guys, thank you so much for watching. Thank you guys for being here. Check out the PDF. Please just click the link below. It's awesome, I promise you. And I will see you all in two days.